Good afternoon. Uh, this is Raven Munez, and we're here to talk about how better identify your organization's military, uh, military uh, veterans and uh, associates. So uh, I'd like to start by um, letting the panel introduce themselves and uh, tell, tell us a little bit about what you do with your organization, and uh, we'll go forward from there. I'll jump in first and then I'll talk okay. who's next. So I'm Meg Hendricks, I'm an Army veteran and I head up military and veteran affairs at Fiserv. So that's everything within our Fiserv Salutes program. I'm really excited to have this conversation today. I think the common theme that um, I've been hearing in a lot of conversations recently is that self ID is like a constant challenge even for the companies who you may think are are aces at it they're still kind of constantly trying to figure out the best way to do it so the one thing i would say is we would love to hear you know your thoughts um in the chat and any questions that you have we want this to be interactive and you know for sure provide your feedback as well so i will pass it over to josh to introduce himself Thank you very much. Hello, everyone. I'm Joshua Wilson. I'm the Corporate Relationship Manager at America's Warrior Partnership. Uh, my primary role is to connect military connected employees from military affairs programs all over the country to our network so that we can uh, get social workers in on the cases. And I work with companies as well to tackle problems like this. So I'm happy to be here and uh, it's going to be a great panel today. supposed to tag who's next josh yeah 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 <laughs> yes yeah we'll pass it over okay sounds good uh thanks josh uh my name is rob arndt and i am a 14-year marine corps veteran and i am the ceo and founder of buffer springs we are a training smart organizations build military effective recruitment engagement and retention programs so looking forward to sharing this panel with uh uh, the other colleagues on here today and uh, helping you guys solve this problem, self-identification that's so prevalent. And I'll pass the torch over to Garrett. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Hi, everyone. My name is Garrett Bosch. I'm a U.S. Navy veteran. I'm currently a supply base manager uh, for Teradyne, which is a company that manufactures semiconductor test equipment. And I'm also the chairperson of our recently established veteran resource group, which is a uh, um, employee resource group at our company. And we kicked off a campaign um, to solicit veterans and employees of our company to self-identify in our HR database as we kicked off our veterans resource group um, to the company earlier this year. Uh, so welcome everyone and I'll pass it over to Red. Hi, I'm Ray Bermudez. Um, I work with Meg at Fiserv. And uh, until recently, I was a uh, vice president of human resources there. I've moved on to uh, business continuity now. I am also a Navy veteran. Happy birthday. And uh, that's, that's it. We'll get started right now. How about <laughs> OK, so uh, what we want to talk about is, you know, military self ID and best practices. Um, you know, one of the first steps of becoming a great employer for veterans and military knowing your your people right knowing those who are connected to the military uh associates family members uh even people that just want to be affiliated um and a lot of difficulties there's a lot of difficulty involved with finding out who these people are and identifying them um and allowing them to self-identify identify themselves you know so um a lot of companies have a difficult time doing that um some of the reasons why they're hesitant to identify themselves are stereotypes, uh, you know, associating veteran with PTSD, uh, confusion, of, confusion of, you know, if I'm a veteran or if I'm a retiree, uh, people who've had negative experiences in the military, they don't want to be involved anymore. Uh, but a, a, a lot of these things, these negative perceptions, you know, are, are ways that we, are opportunities for us to help these associates one uh become uh, available have availability to benefits that we offer through our companies right uh, if we don't know who they are we can't we can't offer these benefits to them so you know how do we overcome some of these obstacles um anyone here want to chime in on that if they have any experience with some of these issues 
Yeah, I'll, I'll tag in. So there, there's for self-identification, there's two different stages of that. There's the before stage and then the after, after stage. And there, and we see different issues in different in those different channels. The before stage, veterans, especially transitioning veterans, when they're being asked on an application somewhere, if you're a military veteran, they don't necessarily know what that information is going to be used for. So they're and they're reluctant to self-identify. They don't know who's on the other side of that or what that information is, is going to, you know, why they need to disclose that information. And then to top it off, where veterans, the majority of us, or about 40% of us, are submitting DA or uh, VA disability claims, the next question on there is usually, do you have a disability rating or, or do you identify as a person with a disability? So now we're starting to look at those as potential knockout questions that if I say yes to this and yes to this, am I now knocking myself out of the running for employment? So those are some of the issues up front and it's hard to actually sell that or show that applicant the why, but for your current engaged employees, um, it's getting them to self-identify and come out. And there's different ways that we're going to cover today to go on that. But you know, there's those two different channels and those are two different pain points that need to be solved that hopefully we can shed some light on today. And I'll open the floor up to, you know, one of you to chime in on there as well. I'd like to, to tag in. This is Joshua, everyone. And one of the things that I thought was particularly useful um, was an organization that straight, uh, straightforwardly communicated in the application. There was an information page. You know, you're about to see the following voluntary self-disclosures. These are important for us because they help us identify our veterans. These are important for us because they give us a work opportunity tax credit. And they are by no means, and they had this in bold, a detriment to your application. So it doesn't have to use that specific wording. But they, there are employers out there who are a little bit more transparent and take a little extra time to get away from that boilerplate application process to add some of that stuff in, which supplements um, the hesitancy that you see on this slide. But yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And it's not a lot of work to do that either. So. We got a couple comments and questions going on in the chat. So I'll jump in there. Chris, I think this one that you asked, what challenges have you faced in identifying your respective military employees? I think we're going to talk about that kind of throughout. But if we if you don't feel like we cover that by the end, definitely uh, call us out for that. Um, I think something I'd ask the panelists to think about and, and address as we're going on, maybe not exactly right now. And Rob, we were talking about this a little bit before, but the the legal aspects of the veteran status and how that might impact um, how you can collect self ID and once you have self ID, once you have folks who've self ID, you know what you can do with that. Um, and then you know to kind of go on to what Rob had said was talking about the two different stages. So Jonathan asked. What should that pre-offer veteran self-identification status look like to make military talent feel comfortable and safe to disclose? Joshua, you definitely like touched on that a little bit, but Rob, maybe you want to jump off of there as well. And Garrett Ray, feel free to jump in. Yeah, I'd love to address uh, Jonathan's question on there. So as far as the legal um, matters that are, that are at hand, so you have mandates that are out there. For those of us that are on the HR side or the talent acquisition talent acquisition side of this, there are mandates from the Department of Labor, the EEOC, the OFCCP, and compliance mandates that are there. So, But compliance is your driving factor as an HR person, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything to an applicant or to your worker, especially your retained workforce. If you're asking me those questions to gather up data for your EEO1 form or for your affirmative action plan, I don't know what you're doing with that data, and I may not disclose that because it doesn't stop me from doing my job. I'm already working here. I'm already doing it. Why do you need this information? It doesn't stop me or, you know, add any advantages to me that are evident. So with those with types that are out there, you have four different types. You have your disabled veterans. You have your recently separated veterans, your active duty wartime or campaign badge veterans, and then your armed services uh, um metal recipient veterans that are on there. So there's different class, uh, classes that are in there. But when you're looking at those, there has to be a reason behind it. From an applicant stage, you're being asked these questions, but I'm self-identifying things that I don't know that it's going to be used for. But there's things that you can do to combat that. So by building a military effective brand, having your careers page, having a military careers page that's on there and showing authenticity through that, not your stock boilerplate stock images of veterans, but showing veterans within your organization doing great things and showing that you have a military effective culture makes me more apt to want to self-identify and belong to that bigger group and see that I have a place in your company. And that may make it so I'm more apt to, to give my information out there because I can see how I'm going to fit into your culture. 
But from a legal standpoint, it's it's usually difficult to get folks to identify if there's no with them or the what's in it for me. If you're doing it just to gather data, that means nothing to your applicants or your employees. You have to show meat behind it, what's going to happen, or if you're becoming a part of a club or getting access to different benefits or different things without the business that are meant to stimulate veteran employees and show that and celebrate that culture. That's how you have to showcase that. And then you'll get your legal answers from that. So Jonathan, I hope that answers a question that's a large nebulous topic and I can connect with you offline on this, um, you know, but you know, that that's, you know, the best answer that I can give you right now in the short time that we have. I would also say there's like a couple different ways to do this because the, the categories that you were referring to Rob are generally the ones that are covered under the VEVRA form. And that's like what's required. If you're a government contractor as a company, you capture VEVRA, but most companies that are, have self ID ask it again. So they ask people for that separate from the VEVRA form so that they have the opportunity to potentially use that information as long as they've disclosed appropriately. Um, so, and so I would say like, like at Pfizer, we, we capture veterans of all eras. We say that a military spouse is someone who is or has ever been a military spouse. Companies define that differently. There's not necessarily a right answer on how to capture the military spouse population because the whole point is like if they were a military spouse that impacted their career but they aren't now they maybe still need some extra assistance if they have like um career gaps or different things like that so um so let's lisa asked you know what about current employees how do we reach them legally anyone want to jump in there uh, i'm tagging in again on this one as well so um and this is free to anyone in the audience. Um, our network that I was speaking about is benefits for military connected employees. So it's quality of life improvement, whether it's through a local veteran service officer, through a community based representative, through volunteer opportunities, if it's not for a veteran directly and for anything that's related to financial assistance, legal assistance, America's Warrior Partnership finds those partners and we bring those resources. What we do with employers and America's Warrior Partnership is by no means the only one that does it. We're actually a hub for it is that we encourage the creation of an employee resource group. If you haven't already made one and if you have already made one like at Fiserv, the Military Leadership Council, then at that point we offer an invitation not only to self-identify if you already haven't, but also to come learn about our resources. And this is extremely common with companies all over the country. USA Today has a similar one called Military Forward. And each month they host an opportunity to self-identify. They host an opportunity to come see the group even without identifying. And then you come in and you join the Slack channel and you get to listen to whatever uh, military affiliated birthdays are happening that month. You might hear about a military employee who has offered. So there's a lot of soft approaches that can happen the HR application process to engage your employees and to celebrate what they did in the military and what they'll do in the community. And so whether you partner with America's Warrior Partnership or you build it internally on your own or you look for other partners such as ETS sponsorship or IVMF, the nonprofit list is large. You can use that as a springboard to attract your employees to participate. And then it's employee driven in terms of the program. And so, like I said, you can see that at Fiserv. I think I think what also helps too is that you know senior leadership engagement. Um, you know, at Fiserv, our our CEO is a huge veteran advocate, and uh, he makes it known. So I, I think that's important as well. You know, once you come to the company, you get the words, you get the orientation, but when you see the CEO, you know, sending messages out to veterans, and, you know, and and being engaged and, and showing that there is support from the top level. I think that's important as well. Yeah, and Ray, I, yeah, Ray, I totally agree with that as well. You know, we when we launched our veterans resource group at my company, you know, we had an executive sponsor of that that was not a veteran, but he was a vice president for our Milero business unit. Um, and when we launched it, you know, it was by no accident that I was the chairperson as a U.S. Navy veteran to start the group, and we opened up the invitation to all U.S. employees, you know, about a thousand of our 5,000 employees are located in the U.S. And we invited them to this veterans resource group information ses session, regardless if they're veteran status or if they just wanted to help support the veteran community or have loved ones that had served or are currently serving. Um, 
And with that, we were able to provide in that information session, just one small piece of it, the information about veterans, the four classifications of their status, inviting them to self-identify in our database. And some of the, you know, you know, very high level for that audience, some of the legal reasons of why they should join, why they should self-identify, some of the benefits that they could be granted because of that and the way our company could then track our metrics of our veterans employees appropriately for compliance reasons. And we, you know, then gave them the invitation to contact myself and our HR department to learn more if they had more detailed questions after that information session before they went in and self-identified with one of those four classifications. So that personal invite to them afterwards meant a lot. And some of them did contact me before they went in and did self-identify. Yeah, and then and the, the senior leadership doesn't necessarily have to be a veteran either. You know, ours is, you know, but he he's an advocate. That's the important thing. And that's crucial to the success of your program. Your leaders are going to dictate the tone and the pace of that. And if leadership's not behind this and not buying into it publicly, everyone else isn't going to fall in line and think this is just something happening in, within a corner of the company there. So that's the program. And like you said, these people don't have to be veterans. This is about celebrating your coworkers and getting to know who you're with and bringing your whole self to work and having everyone feel comfortable with that and celebrating those differences of how they make our organization stronger. So, I mean, that is a crucial piece to this. Could I add one thing to this executive leadership thing? This is a pretty common issue that I come with. We might have a VP of human resources or maybe a CEO or CFO who becomes really excited about expanding their military affairs. And they will give the directive, hey, we want you to work with America's Warrior Partnership to build this up. For anyone who's out in the audience, what I would definitely say, be very clear when you are teaming up with your executive sponsor to include HR in the mix because HR keeps the aggregate data of the veterans that you hire and retain, which is exceptionally important for the Department of Labor's Hire Vets Medallion Program, for military-friendly certifications, for vet indexes and others. And so if you want to be represented you want to grow your program, you need not only the executive support, but the authorization to get some of that data and the authorization to provide incentives, maybe recognition for military service or days off or community events. And so the more resources that you can get while you're getting that executive sponsorship, the more effective you, you'll be in actually building your program. And I just wanted to be clear with that because they okay. And then when they get to me, they don't actually have resources or or manpower so you do need some uh but you can spend it smartly of course um yeah and that that kind of segues into our best practices piece too you know um like we've been talking about you want to create a culture where people feel safe to identify themselves right um you want to foster that environment where the employees feel seen and connected you know there's many different things you can do uh as an organization to to create that environment uh and uh the the data confidentiality the transparency that is key and critical i think uh, for the most part what do you what do you think so we have a question in the chat that ties in really well with this um when we're talking about culture so Jess asks, in addition to an employee veteran group or military group, does anyone have experience with branch specific small groups as well? Um, and does anyone have experience creating a veteran leadership group? Uh, Jess, yes, I think a lot of us probably do have experience, but let's go back to like the first one, um, experience with branch specific small groups as well. Military population, military folks make up less than 5% of the population as it is. When you start creating all these subgroups of it, it makes it harder to get those people in the first place because you may have fractional populations. You may only have one Marine at your company or one Coastie at your company in the first place. So it's going to be a very small group with very fast meetings if you do that. What I've seen companies do with their employee resource groups, though, is have veterans be able to identify their certain branches. I have one company that I've worked with that uh, had lanyards for all the people that would show up with their meetings and they were different colors. So they had red ones for Marines, green for Army. So you can identify your different branches. That helps build camaraderie. You may have some, you know, chop busting or whatnot, inner service rivalries and, you know, go Army, go Navy or whatever in there. But that'll help them to kind of break the ice and open up channels of communication. But I haven't seen any subgroups actually be successful 
that are branch specific in the past. And I'll open it up to anyone else's thoughts on that. I would say like with most um, volunteer type organizations, which employee resource groups are, you're going to have like a maybe 10% of the group that's going to be really excited to do a lot of things and the rest will come to some things and participate in some things here and there. So I think to Rob's point, I mean, keeping it to a military employee resource group, I think it makes sense to not call it a veteran resource group. To me, I think mo most of us are moving more towards a more holistic approach with like military spouses, dependents, and then of course, you, you know, supporters and allies are always generally invited to be a part of employee or business resource groups. So, um, you know, I would keep that in mind and keep it kind of that broader group. And then, you know, if you end up with a really large group and it, and it kind of depends on how your company is set up too. like if you're dispersed across different locations, that's going to be definitely harder to have like smaller subgroups. If you're a really big company, but at like one location, you might be able to do that. So I think it's very, it's going to be very across your company, your, you know, what you have the capacity to do and who's located where and kind of all those different things. And to Meg's point, this is a voluntary thing where people are chiming in on their own time. The more meetings, the more group things that you have going on, you're going to have less people showing up to them just because they don't have the bandwidth. Or if I'm not military myself, if I'm not a veteran, I'm not a military spouse, but I'm a supporter how do I decide which one do I join? Do I go to the Coast Guard meetings? Do I go to the Marine Corps meetings? Or, you know, how do I divide my time into this thing that I'm passionate about, but still coincides with the rest of my work day and life and everything else? Yeah, I agree. I think having a successful ERG that's a, that has a broader net that allows you to bring in everybody that's military affiliated and or supporters will make it much more successful for you. And in terms of getting your benefits, like, if you want to upgrade your disability or discharge, the most effective, you know, referrals come from family members. So family members are a huge target audience. The last time that we checked, and this is outside of just our corporate workings, corporate corporations are a very smart of a very small part of AWP. We're a large organization focused in communities and about 40% of all of our cases come from family member referrals. So in actually making impact in veterans lives, you have to reach the family. Um, in addition for affinity specific stuff, what I tend to see a lot of companies who are doing it right in terms of a best practice, you have a group that's big, but you say, Hey, check out this Facebook page for aviation ordinance men, check out this page for grunts and, and people will jump into their separate groups in their own time. And then they'll refer back and forth. And so it builds our larger community. Um, one other question we have is like share examples of best practices and what you would consider a military friendly onboarding processes. I think one thing is uh, part of your orientation process should include a specific uh, section discussing all your ERGs, you know, and uh, and if you only have the military one, fine, but going into in depth as to what they offer and you know the the types of ERGs you have, um, I think that would that would help, you know, uh, and 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 then branch out. If someone has questions about the military ERG. Then, you know, if you have something like a mentorship program, say, you know, mention those as well. But I think it's the communication of what the ERGs offer um, is, is, is critical on, on orientation. And Ray, I think a good point you bring up there is like making sure that the military piece is like part of your larger DNI strategy because like it needs to all be integrated. And it's interesting because some people don't consider military to be part of like the DNI. So, some people feel that it's not, but um, I think we hopefully everyone here knows like the military is like one of the most diverse, you know, cohorts that you could have. So um, just making sure that it's integrated into your talent acquisition strategy. It may not be initially if you're setting up your program, but like that's really where you would want to move towards is, you know, not having like one or two people trying to go out there and beat the drum and be like, let's hire military. It's really getting it integrated into the company um, yeah. verbiage and culture and things like that. Yeah, I'd, I'd say at my company, the thing we started this year was we got embedded with our HR's recruiting group. And as they got applications for any job postings we had, 
where the applicant had already in their application stated they were a veteran of any of the classifications or just in their resume that they had their military background in there as experience. That HR recruiter would then ask the hiring manager for that job posting. If you want to have a current um, veteran employee of Teradyne sit on the interview board for that candidate to give them exposure to another veteran employee of our company before they're even hired, that's gone a long way in attracting veteran talent into our company because it's very personal. They're already meeting a veteran that's employed at our company and we can share our experience in our company before they're even hired as a veteran. It's a great point and, and to, to add on to that. So part of it is education. If you have your stakeholders, your primary and your secondary stakeholders, the folks who are gonna be interviewing or sourcing and screening veterans, they have to know what they're looking at. We, I, I'm working with a large global organization right now that we're looking at military almost as if they were coming from some distant planet. But once we did some military 101 training and showed them rank structure, the differences between enlisted and officer ranks and the different branches, they realized that their corporation is actually set up very similar to the military and they could identify that their people on the call or the people in the training session were you know, the equivalent of a JMO or a junior military officer and what their responsibilities are. But sometimes just giving them that knowledge base and giving them that comfort that when they're talking with military people goes a long way. But if you're not educating those people that are the gateways into your company, there's room for error in there and people are going to fall through that contact to contract chain. I might add to that and say that those trainings um, are free, right? Uh, they're provided by a lot of different organizations. The most recent one that comes to mind is Psych Armor. I do think Psych Armor stuff still free, and they have military supportive supervisor training. They have basic training on what the different branches of military uh, uh, military operations are, and 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 MOSs and things like that. And then you know also. Uh, having at least a brief overview of job accommodations that are associated with military, I tend to found as someone who was not with an HR background when I was learning uh, this role was very, very helpful. So, um, but if, if anyone out there is looking for those kind of resources, looking to connect, uh, I could definitely find you some free ones uh, that would be useful for your organization. So we have a couple more questions about ERGs. I'm kind of wondering if it's going too far off topic. I do think that culture is important, but um maybe there's some opportunities to engage in those discussions about ERGs and some of the other sessions. So if we have time at the end, we'll address some of those questions. But Ray, go ahead and take it away for this. Right. So, you know, we're going to be taking these one by one. So reducing the confusion of veteran versus retiree, right? Um, there are people out there who are retirees who, who believe it or not, don't consider themselves veterans or um, and, you know, we need to be able to reach out to them as well and engage them and have them, you know, identify themselves as veterans because that's what they are. Um, any thoughts on that panel? The oh, difficult you, or better you think, than, if, I'm sorry, go ahead. Veteran, oh, go ahead, Ray. I was going to say, you know, do you think maybe you know, people involved in other ERGs that don't consider themselves veterans, but just their retirees, you know, maybe we can use them and engage the other ERGs to help as well. Or Well, retiree has its own issues going on as well, because when you see a retiree on an application, you're thinking somebody who's kicking it up, you know, they're retired, like retirement isn't for military. Some of us joined when we were 17 years old and we're retired at 37. We still have a lot of gas left in the tank and a lot of things we want to do in our professional career, but I've seen retiree even have a negative stigma that we have somebody that just is looking for their twilight tour or something to do as a hobby, and they have this mass amount of money coming in, which we as veterans know is not the case. So I've seen that, you know, where right. you know, almost a double whammy where you're identifying as a vet and as a retired vet. So it depends on who's on the other side of that and if they've been educated, but this is a, you know, a point that a lot of people don't necessarily understand. Mm -hmm. And I think too, oh, sorry, I just flipped through all these slides. I think also we, we need to, you know, it's the language, the language that we use, right? Um, I, I think, again, we want to keep a broader question out there. Um, are you a veteran or military affiliated uh, uh, employee? You know, do you, are you a military uh, spouse or were a military spouse? I think if we keep those questions broad instead of being very specific, um, 
I think that helps as well. That brings it, that'll bring in more people to identify. I mean, they won't be as specific as what's required for reporting purposes with the government, but for your internal purposes, as far as your corporation are concerned, I think you know that would be adequate. Thoughts? You go broad, and I also think you can add incentives. Uh, one of the surveys that we do each year for community integration, because we're that are in cities and we've started to send it out to companies as well but we offer a raffle uh with the survey entry you will receive you know an opportunity to get a big old gift card uh for you and your family and then when we do give those things out we we show that so you know because you're going to constantly onboard employees you're going to do it either through your newsletter through your erg or maybe even just on a quarterly basis maybe even during enrollment periods hey here's a reminder of the the volunteer groups that we have you should join these as well and so if you're doing that and you're able to provide incentives in the long term the employees will know and then they will encourage new hires say make sure you join this group you know make sure you fill out a survey there's actually real benefits so and so got a day off last year because you know that kind of thing so the engagement right. piece is critical good idea okay and i know we're running short on time but if, if we can address the erg um issue because ERGs are going to be one of your strongest ways to get people to self-identify. And ERGs are the new buzz. They're the, every, you know, all the cool kids have to have them now, but they have to have, you know, intention and action behind them. It can't be, hey, vets get free coffee and donuts in the break room every second Tuesday of the month or something like that. Like there has to be engagement to that. And if you have that, if you're highlighting the, the voices of your veterans and amplifying those, letting them tell their stories, letting them tell their coworkers about how their military service affects them or you know impacts them in their job either positively or negatively and air that stuff out that's going to get more people to want to step up and identify and be a part of that and in kind of shed off those fears and there's different ways that you can do that but it's about you know taking it the more than just that coffee and donuts but bringing in guest speakers bringing in benefits for your veterans and empowering your workforce and taking care of them not only while they're with you but when they go home to help them link in with their disability claims or education benefits or progress in their careers, linking them in with mentors within the organization, even if those folks aren't military or connecting them with battle buddies and finding other people that they can build camaraderie and build a bond with. Those ERGs are going to be crucial to getting your other people to step up and say, you know what? I want to be a part of that too. Absolutely. Well, and so to, if we do want to, um, address two of the questions. So one is pretty interesting to me because I'm interested to see what you guys, um, what your companies, how you're handling this. Um, but, you know, dealing with global companies um, and corporations, you know, are companies integrating globally? Um, you know, they're starting, uh, Rocco said that they're starting um, a veteran ERG and getting a push for global inclusion. What are, what are the thoughts on that? I have one if no one else does. Okay. I just didn't want to interrupt. Um, yeah. Thank you. So we've had this issue come up a few times before. Obviously, America's Warrior Partnership, the goal is inclusion. Inclusion of family members, spouses, supporters. So we do try to include. However, regardless of whether it's a veteran service officer or it's a financial or it's a legal or it's um, a, a national VSO or maybe like a CBOT, they, these are all government programs. And so the issues related to veteran care almost always tie in with the VA or some other associated group. I've had a difficult, uh, it's been a difficult challenge to try to coordinate services for people who've served outside the U.S. So generally the way that we do it is we, anyone who has served in the U.S. military to the extent that they're eligible for, for VA benefits or nonprofit veteran will take care of. But for those who have served in other countries, it's just general affinity can join us as a reference. But I'm interested if anyone else has any better ideas. But yeah, it's just the VA benefits is so critical that if I can't provide those in some ways or or help you get more of those in some ways. That's where the, the big funding is very difficult. I would say yeah. don't boil the ocean. If you're a global organization, you're looking at global and a lot of different militaries that are out there. You know, the Brits are different than us, you know, in every other military that's out there. I would concentrate on building a core 
foundation with your U, if you're a US based company, do it here in the US and then expand and try to perfect that and get people joining. Other veterans will join word of mouth, other people will start hearing about it. But if you focus on that core, you know, foundation of it, that's going to get a lot more traction than trying to do a global thing that's it's not going to work out. There's too many different nuances from country to country. Yeah, I totally agree, Rob. And that's what we've done at my company is we started in the US because we didn't want to boil that ocean because we viewed it as like it needed to start at like the size of like a pea and we had to start rolling the snowball, have information sessions, bring in guest speakers, get the word of mouth going among the veterans and the supporters of veterans in our company. And we've just done that with our US employees to start. And then seeing as all these are global employees from outside the US wanted to be involved is when we were going to start to branch out beyond the United States. And it also got back to the point of like, we didn't start out as branch specific, because again, we didn't want to try to start to partition things too much early on. And so maybe you guys like, right, maybe you have something else that you want them to, to share because we have like three minutes, but you could share best approaches to implementing starting a respective ERG or just one last thing that you want to share about self ID because um, we have three minutes. Yeah. Meg, I can do okay. 10 seconds. Say again? Oh, sorry. I was going to say just one last 10 second note. Yeah, sure. For the previous, yeah, for the previous point, um, I just forgot about this. If you have people who have self identified with other militaries, I would say let them start the program, even if it's just really small. I just wanted to throw that out there. I'd forgotten there are some companies that have done that to some. To... Okay. So I've just touched on this, you know, the open communication piece, you know, for data collection and uh, corporate champion spokesperson. And I kind of jumped the gun on this slide a while back. So, um, you know, is there anything else that anyone wants to chime in? I mean, we did touch base on the, you know, those associates that were had negative, uh, negative experiences in the military. How do we overcome that hurdle, you know, or was there negative experience in the military having to do with this civilian sector? You know, anybody come across anything like that before? For the ERG universally, I would recommend like opening that up to anyone who wants to support and be in part of that community. Don't make your ERG just for veterans and just this like club for vets. It's like, you know, it's like one you're giving one of your kids candy and seeing what the other ones are going to fight over it. So it can't be just that one population. So open it up to everybody. So there's an era an aura of uh, you know learning and getting to know that group, but then also have things specifically for veterans. Hey, today we're just going to be doing some things with the vets or having the VA come in to talk today, which is going to be more to that audience and helping them. I mean, even things that are going on, we just had the debacle in Afghanistan last year and there were vets that were, you know, had feelings and thoughts about that, but they couldn't talk about them in open forum with their civilian counterparts. So there has to be a balance there. Has to be open to everybody, but then there has to be things that are specific to your military populace that serve them specifically. I and mean, I think that's a good takeaway for all ERGs, right? I mean, one hundred percent. They should be open for to, to the entire population, you know, and the advocates. So. Anything else? Any other comments, Meg? Um, I will make a comment on the question about, you know, what is the best approach to discuss implementing starting a respective veteran ERG within your company? Um, I would, if you don't have other ERGs and like that's your starting that we want to have ERGs, I would start with building the business case. It's going to be a little bit difficult because you're not going to necessarily have a lot of quantitative data, but I would say that when you're approaching like that, but approach it more strategically, do professional development, networking, have your talent acquisition part of that and, you know, different things like that so that it's really tied into the business, but is also providing support for the associates that are part of the ERG. Anyone want to weigh in on that in the last 30 seconds? <laughs> Go. Meg, to your point on the business case, be happy. there are opportunities or channels within the business that you can showcase to veterans. Like as vets, we've all led, we've all followed. If there's opportunities where people are, you know, right now there's there's a talent war going on. You may have people that are going to leave, but if you're showing them upward or lateral mobility and different leadership channels or different things that they can do in their careers to progress, you may actually retain workforce from having that focused on the business case and navigating them through the company and showing them opportunities that they may not have known existed. So that's another thing that ERGs, you know, that are done well, you know, it, it doesn't only help the individual employee, but helps the entire business 
to move the needle forward and gets executive buy-in because that's happening. And it's not all just fluff and potlucks and things like that. Okay, well, I, I, I think we're out of time. Uh, so thank you all for attending. I hope we were able to answer the questions that were out there. Um, and uh, again, I believe my link is uh, attached to this broadcast as well. If anybody wants to connect with me on LinkedIn, they're more than welcome to. Um, and we can take the discussion further. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. All right. Yeah. Thank you guys for having me. Yeah. Thanks, everyone.